Brown is the whole new world. I call this meeting um, to order. Next, we have the school board's adopted um, budget for fiscal year 2020. Good evening, Mayor Walker, Vice Mayor Hill, City Manager, all of you City Council. Thank you for having us. I'm Jennifer McKeever, the Chair of the Charlottesville City School Board. I want to um, introduce Dr. Rosa Atkins and Kim Powell. Um, Jim Henderson's here, Renee Hoover, Dr. King, Dr. Um, Kendra King, and then our school board representatives, Lisa Torres, James Bryant, Leah Purrier, Sherry Croft, and me. So thank you for having us today, and we are uh, delighted to introduce our 2020, fiscal 2020 um, school budget. So we are just kind of just highlight some of the, what the investments that you all have made in the schools over the past several years have really led to some great progress, including our excellent uh, on-time graduation rate of 92.6%. Uh, we're very pleased with that and continue, want to continue to grow that rate. Um, we've also expanded um, our honors options courses so that um, if you are in a language arts class in ninth grade, you, are, you have the option to take an, the honors um, and you are with uh, all sorts of uh, your peers in that class studying the same material. Um, our family engagement and outreach efforts, you'll see we've also asked for additional support for that this year, but because of the growth um, and excellent work that of our family engagement coordinator, we really feel like we need to duplicate her um, because the work is really outstanding. She is doing great things with advising parents about how to approach a parent-teacher conference. She's engaging um, parents at the bus stop. It's just been really extraordinary to see um, how that uh, redoubles into the classroom with for our students. Um, of course, our uh, suspension rates are de declining. We are committed, of course, to equity. That takes many forms in this particular budget. Um, and then we also uh, have our trauma, which we call a social emotional learning and mental wellness. We, the, um, we have trauma informed classrooms at two schools, three different classrooms. It's really extraordinary to see the um, efforts that uh, the teachers and the students, the, and, the, and being able to focus on learning in, and instead of the kind of hierarchy of needs at that point, uh, that we can meet their need, meet them where they are, and then they can actually learn from there. And it's, it's an extraordinary um, process and an extraordinary commitment that the city has made to these students to get them to where they need to be academically. Um, we're very excited about the Clark School modernization. You guys, I think, saw the video at uh, our work session. Um, it just really makes a difference to see the modern classroom and how, um, how that affects our children. And we're very excited that the CIP for next year supports modernization of Jackson Via. Um, I just think that's a really great initiative that we want to thank council for all of these initiatives um, and supporting the schools as you have. Um, our commitments for this particular budget is to attract and retain the uh, best teachers, as you know, we have a nationwide student, um, nationwide teacher shortage, and we have a very, uh, we are very seeking to hire the best student, best teachers, uh, particularly teachers of color, and we have uh, very significant pressures on our teacher in our division, and so we just uh, to remain competitive. You'll see that what we have asked for in this budget includes a um, very, you know, a, a not significant, but a, a raise um, that we hope will su support additional investments in our teachers, um, so that we can keep our uh, keep them to come to our division. Um, so we're also this budget also plans for growth, um, and we also kind of looking ahead. Are trying uh, the school board is seeking to reconfigure you know a plan that has been on the book since 2009 at least um, which involves creating a centralized preschool and then a, a unified middle school of sixth through eighth grade and then the fifth grade returning to the elementary school we are um, 
We just believe that students, this vision that the school board has will serve the, uh, all of our students better uh, and particularly will um, serve the students in middle years because it's such a tricky age and uh, having less transitions during those particular years, it's, the research just shows that that supports students better. And with those relationships over the years, um, the sixth through eighth years, like just having the two-year schools really has, is an impediment to achievement for our children. And having one unified middle school, we believe, will serve all of our students. So that's just kind of looking ahead, what we're, what we're hoping as we move forward. That is the vision that the school board wants to see implemented uh, sooner rather than later although it has been on the table for a long time. But, um, so with this budget, we're very proud, is an opportunity. Um, the main thrust of this, um, of course, is the non-discretionary expenses, the contracts, and the um, health insurance is always a huge increase. So that's a lot of the non-discretionary funding um, is there. But then what we're really proud of is to move eligible teachers up one step plus 3.75%. So basically a, an average salary increase of 5%. And then move other eligible staff up about 4%. But we, the living wage for custodial instructional assistance and nutrition staff is um, where at the heart of the school board really lie. Um, we um, really want to see that happen for um, our staff and we this the living wage and our wage package for teachers and maintaining our benefits helps us to retain and attract quality teachers um, so we are keeping the health insurance increase at eight percent hope you know we're just going to make some tweaks at that um, and then some of the budget changes that we have are requesting on this page is continuation of grant funded programs and that these were formally funded by grants that we are asked that we in order to maintain the level services this is what we need to, to support that including the AVID program all of these uh, support our um, our students who need support the most and so we're really proud to um, continue that support uh, the other uh, School-based program supports and improvements include the trauma-informed classroom that I was talking about was adding like the, the SEAL, which is the social emotional learning class at Clark, adding an IA there. Um, the request for the pre-K two family connections facilitator is that um, kind of duplicating that engagement person. Um, and increasing tuition reimbursement is another one of those uh, areas about supporting and retaining our teachers that is to doubles the amount of, um, of uh, I can't remember the to, IAs. yeah for IAs okay so it's basically to support uh, professional development for our um, staff and um, then the rest of the 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 teachers is, are basically all due to enrollment projections um, and then we are also increasing both the daily rate for substitutes and the long-term rates for substitutes. Again, a very significant issue is um, having quality substitutes, and we're hoping that this will support that um, effort. And then budget changes here are mostly just the um, as school operations like all of these things are needed because our um, our increased usage and reliance on the internet and our kind of computer things which I do not speak that language obviously <laughs> um, and then um, based on enrollment projections we are probably going to this is just kind of a net um, we're going to have like we're actually going to be plus two teachers but this is where we're going to have one, also one reduction so the re request from the um, where the next slide shows um, our request which is uh, 3.368421 um, that we are requesting from the city at this time 
and we were asked to reduce our um, proposed request by a half a million dollars, um, which is about so five hundred thousand. So we were asked to reduce our um, request by five hundred thousand. And as you can see, some of these are really near and dear to our heart. Um, some of the things that we had to take out in order to meet our um, meet that request, and I, some of that was. Um, supporting equity in our schools, including, the, I feel like, the math, AVID, and ISTEM teachers in particular, and also the Family Connections materials. Actually, all of these really affect equity and are, um, are, are things that the superintendent and the school board feel really strongly that we would like to see funded. Um, but we recognize that, um, that there are limited resources, and th these were the, the um, proposed cut, the cuts that we took out in order to support the, the proposal. Did you have a question? Yeah, so the 3.8 was your, obviously we remember your original request, and now the 3.3 is just, you're just saying that's the delta, like this is the things that we have pulled out to get to that 3.3. Yes. I'm just making sure that I was understanding the order. Right. Thanks. And you can see our commitment really was to the wages and salaries of the, our um, staff, because we, sure. you know, um, but that these would actually also serve um, our students that, and we're kind of, you know, so we're always looking for ways to kind of note that if there was an extra 500,000 around, we would really like to fund an AVID teacher at Buford and a math specialist that goes vertically aligns between Walker and the high school. And the iSTEM is something that, I don't know, I have an elementary school child, he's in second grade, and every day when he comes home after iSTEM, it is dramatic. He tells me exactly what he's done, and every student in that school has an opportunity to take that um, class. And we don't have one at every elementary school, so they travel, which is fine, but um, to support, to really support that engagement, I think um, we, our goal is to have one at every at every school. Um, but we'll get there. We have a lot of other priorities too, so, and we understand that. Um, yeah, this is a, these are graphs. Yeah. <laughs> so, good, e good evening, I made this graph. Um, so this is simply, um, it takes the, the details that you saw on the previous um, slides and it breaks it down by percentages and subtotals. I know that when we've met with you previously, I think the first time during the workshop, I caught some of you trying to do the math and add up those sections, and I was like, oh, I should have put subtotals on there. So anyway, this just gives you the, when you're looking at the overall ask, how much is in non-discretionary expenses, how much is in compensation, and so forth, you'll see 70% of the request is associated with the compensation actions. This is the three point. That this is. Three request. Yes. Yes. So um, again, when you look at that total of 3.8, you're looking at the total budget change, including changes in state revenue and other revenue sources. But that number does not reflect the, the request of the city at this point. The number that we're working right. with there is still reflected on that other page. I'm just trying to establish this is representative of just this incremental thing, because there's a whole other big part of the budget we're not oh, even this talking is about. The, we're just talking about the... What we maybe this is what we refer expect. to as the changes document. Correct. So every year when we work with the board, um, we certainly discuss the overall budget, and that slide is coming up. But you really are focusing on what are the areas mm -hmm. of changes, both decreases and increases. So this is the overall budget summary, and I think that is the changes document that um, yes. Ms. Powell was re referring to. Yes. Um, so sorry, I, I didn't right. mean to sit down too early. Um, this just gives the grand, grand total of the budget. It's important that everyone understand that the total funding, it's reflected in our annual financial report and so forth. The um, general fund represents um, all our, our core operations. Special revenue funds uh, are monies that come in for a specific purpose and they go out for a specific purpose. So it's enterprise funds like our school nutrition program. It's also any type of grant because all of those monies come in for specific purposes. And so we have to take any type of enterprise fund or grant program and those are accounted for under special revenues. Um, the general fund is, is where we spend most of our time um, as far as the actual annual budgeting process. But the, this slide just shows you 
how it all comes together for the grand total. This is still reflecting the 3.8, which it then is. you showed us how you got to the 3.3. Correct. Okay. So the, I mean, yeah. Did you have, are you clear? No, okay, because like on our um, page, um, let's see, page five, the, um, nope. So you can see on page four, state and Medicaid is going to be half a, is going to add fa half a million dollars to our budget, and the local other is like subtracting seventy five thousand, so that equals three point three. Is and um, so the general fund total net revenues is three point eight, which is confusing, but we're only asking the city for three point three. Yeah, it's because the numbers are similar with the states, exactly. it's just creating confusion. And when the exactly. constituents are reaching out to us, I'm confused personally as to whether they're they're really. I mean, I want to know everyone wants more, but like, are they are we showing support for the amount that you're putting in front of us? Or are they still showing support for the amount you put in front of us a month and a half ago? And I'm just trying to understand that. And I also wanted to understand how, what conversations took place between Mr. Murphy and Dr. Adkins to get to this point, because I, I would just like to hear kind of how that. Well, came I mean, just, I don't, I can't. Well, the only thing I want to clarify is you, you make a good point that $500 differential, it really is. 500000 yeah. Right. It, the 500000 differential, it makes that number very similar between the 3.8 and then the 3.3, where right. we, which ended up being the allocation for the But city. you guys are already planning on that state allocation, when we, even when you met with us on the 3.8. Right. So we were, yes. Okay. So a month and a half ago, we were talking about 4.2. Okay. And now we're talking about 3.8, but 3.3 coming from the city. Right. Okay. So... And again, you all are, have been very generous with the schools. We really appreciate the, your investments in the schools. We want to continue that um, trajectory. And this budget, the 3.3 proposal, certainly um, will move, the, move in the right direction. But 3.3 is the budget that you are asking for our support for. Just yes. trying to differentiate that between yes. the before. Because constituents are reaching out, and I'm, I just got a little confused. Well, I would, yes, Dr. Atkins might be able to clarify. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are asking for the 3.3 million. Uh, however, if there is additional revenue, and we do know that there are limited funds, if there is additional revenue, we did cut the 500,000 from the budget. Yep. So if that could be replaced, we would welcome that. But we do understand after talking with Mr. Murphy that our request is 3.3. Thank you. Can I just ask one, what is the average, I, I, this may be the materials, what's our average class size right now? It depends on the school. Okay. Um, because in, in our elementary schools, it depends on the percentage of free and reduced lunch. Uh -huh. uh, it also depends on the uh, class size reduction formula that comes to us from the state. But somewhere right around 18, 19 students, we do go up to 22 in some of our grades and in some of our schools. And at, when you get to fourth grade, you may see 24. I was on a trip to, I was in California last week, and I was, I went to a meeting with some, with a, members of a teacher's union. It's amazing what's happened out there. They had an average size of 45 students in classes in the LA, in the LA school district, and they were just cutting it to 39 as a result of this, of the, of the latest. It just, it was, in, was incredible what the, it's, it's unrelated, sorry. Well, the State was... Department of Education, our standards of quality will allow us to have our classes up to 35 students. Mm. Wow. And, and we're very fortunate in Charlottesville that we, we have never gotten anywhere near that. Thank you. Just wanted to ask. It's very nice to see you all again, and thank you for the presentation. Um, could you talk a little bit about how the changes in the local composite index might have changed your revenue? We're going to all part. Sure. Well, Kim Howard, come up. Because so, that is also something that people in the community are, are confused about. That's correct. So um, the local composite index of ability to pay is adjusted every two years. And so we're now in the second year of the biennium with this new uh, local composite index. And Charlottesville's index moved, and I didn't include any of that material in this presentation, but around 2%. And so um, in terms of dollars, we originally lost around $350,000, dollars in state revenue because of that movement in the LCI. So you think about a 1% or 2% change in that number, and you think, well, what's what's 1% or 2%? But it, it does cost hundreds of thousands of dollars in state revenue. So um, 
we'll look f forward the, the index won't move it will move again for the next budget not fiscal year 20 but for 2021 we'll be looking at that um, index again and seeing the impact that it will have on us it changes every two years and if I could ask uh, the 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 local composite index is a measure of a community's capacity to pay mm -hmm. that is correct. And so we're viewed as a wealthy community we are. And, and they do not factor in our percentage of, of children on the free and reduced lunch program. Correct. And, and Ms. Galvin, one of the things that we're dealing with in this budget is at the end of last year when our composite index did decrease, so what, what the uh, city is expected to contribute increased, um, we were uh, funded $300,000 less than we had anticipated. Mm -hmm. There was a, a whole harmless clause in the budget that was removed at the last moment. So therefore, our funding was decreased by a little over 300,000. So we're reconciling that in okay. this budget also. All right, thank you. And that's one of the major factors that's happening in this mm -hmm. budget. Thank you. And the amount that we contribute automatically increases based on that. So this is still above that amount, correct? The 40%. It's not my time. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you all recall from the joint work session that uh, by formula, we would have contributed $2.2 million, I believe, uh, for this budget to the schools. Uh, and at the time of the joint work session, we were just under uh, 3.1 million, like 3.08. Uh, Dr. Atkins and I talked a little bit about is there anything else we could do? And that's when we added about 280 more thousand and got to the 3.368 that you saw tonight. Okay. Okay. I we'll have a further discussion on Thursday about this, but thank you for the report. And I just want to be on the record of stating I am uh, very much so in support of us finding ways to find the additional $500,000 for them. We'd also like to thank Council uh, with the renovation at Claw. You contributed $1 million for that renovation, and then you will contribute another $1 million for Jackson Viat with our CIP. So we do want to thank Council for that. Thank you. Well, thank you for all your work. And we didn't talk capital specifically, but the $3 million were allocated. Where, where did, because some folks have asked me about that, where did that estimate of that cost come from? And what can you remind yeah, me just yeah. for, the, for the public what the scope of that is? Because mm -hmm. I think there's just a misunderstanding. Sure. So those would that is an estimate of the funds required to get through uh, pre-construction, which would involve uh, design, preliminary testing that's required, any type of geo testing, surveying, those types of testing, uh, and then ultimately get to a, a set of or, or the actual bid documents that that mm -hmm. that. Funding is supposed to get you through that process up to the point of bidding, which then would lead to construction. Okay. And should that process cost less than three million, we will certainly reserve that uh, to be added to anything that would come after uh, the bid process and the construction. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? Thank you for the report. Okay. Great job. Thank, Thank you, you very Thank much you. for your work. And great job on the graduation rate. Thank you. All right. So next we have the city manager's proposed um, fiscal year 2020 budget. Ah, right there. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Yeah, you know, let me just start before we move through the slides by uh, saying that, uh, you know, uh, the, I feel like the budget document is a real expression of uh, both the council and the community's uh, priorities, and uh, there's a lot packed in here. Um, it is difficult uh, to get it all in, and, uh, you know, we're going to have quite a bit of discussion about revenues, I'm sure, in order to get to where we need to go. Um, and while I get to stand here and talk about it, and you know, a lot of the final decisions were mine, I uh, have to acknowledge uh, the work of Assistant City Manager Leslie Beauregard, uh, our budget team with Ryan Davidson and Chrissy Hamill, Chris Cullinan, 
and support from some of our constitutional officers, Todd Divers and Jason Vandiver. So let's go ahead and talk about our budget. So this slide is to tell you we do great work on the budget every year and have for some time. <laughs> we get an award all the time, uh, you know, and uh, I expect that we will again this year. Uh, you know, this is a slide to talk with you all about, you know, putting that 5% into perspective. People talk about the growth in the general fund budget. You see that over the past, you know, 12, 13 years, uh, this is about middle of the road as far as growth in the budget uh, goes. Uh, it has had some up and down years. Uh, it's about, you know, average for where we are right now. That minus 1.19 was my first year on council. I'm sure it wasn't a fun year to approve no. the budget. Yeah, uh, there is some good news out there in the world, uh, and uh, we'll talk about that, particularly with regard to hotels and restaurants <laughs> and other things. But uh, we have we have more jobs uh, in our 10-mile boundary uh, than ever. Uh, we have uh, the lowest unemployment in the state. Uh, vacancy rates wow. are really low uh, and continue to be low both citywide and downtown for commercial properties. Uh, and we have a lot of new developments happening, big developments uh, downtown. Um, there are some additional uh, developments uh, on the big corridors also. You know, the big budget themes we've talked about and what our focus is, affordable housing, preserving and enhancing quality services, investing in employees, focusing on organizational efficiencies, supporting the schools, and the strategic plan and your priorities. You know, there's lots of little bits of this pie. This is basically to reinforce with folks that, you know, about three quarters of the money comes from local taxes, and that's the combined, you know, effect of things like lodging, real estate, uh, meals, etc. So we get to real estate, um, and you'll see that uh, the budget, as has been discussed in the media, is uh, built around the concept that although council endorsed advertising going to 97 cents, that's not uh, something we took advantage of in the revenue sense in this budget. So there's about $1.6 million that could be used should you decide that real estate uh, is you know, something that you believe should be in the budget. And I'll talk uh, at some length about why real estate uh, was not increased, uh, starting with this slide here. And so uh, you need to understand that uh, you know real estate already went up many percentage points. Uh, and so there is new revenue coming into the pot. And um, particularly as we talk about a community that's focused on affordable housing uh, and a average residential increase at 8.7 percent, I want uh, council and the public to understand there is some impact already on people's budget and pocketbooks, right? And so what we're trying to show in this slide and unpack a little bit is, um, you know, even at a house that was only assessed at $150,000, taxes would have gone up or on average $10 every month uh, or more, uh, another $13, $13 a month uh, if we change the tax rate. Of course, you know, when it, the house is worth $600,000, it would have gone up $45 or, you know, $58, you know, depending on whether you did it. What The, the point being that people's pocketbooks are already being hit. And when we compare that to what it would mean to, uh, out of your expenditures, pay more in meals, there's a drastic difference. So uh, next chart, uh, please. So, you know, you all are aware that part of what we're doing um, on the expenditures for meals is talking about these deciles that are in the uh, compu consumer uh, expenditures survey through the Bureau of Labor and Statistics that came out uh, about four or five months ago. Um, we tried to parse out uh, all city properties into deciles as that does. And so, you know, this reinforces kind of what the chart said that I just uh, talked about in a different way, basically saying that when you raise taxes, the minimum uh, it would be would be 230 up to 1238 on top of the tax increase, which was the 8.7% already. 
This is just talking about, uh, you know, why real estate isn't in here right now and to talk a little bit about the gap going forward. We give this uh, slide where, you know, they kind of veer apart every year. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons that happens is we're usually pretty conservative, projecting, you know, one or two percent growth at the most. Um, and uh, sometimes we grow a little bit more than that, sometimes not quite as much. Uh, in a year like this, um, you look at uh, we're adding new debt, uh, $850,000 every year, like a new mortgage payment of $850,000, if you can imagine such a thing, uh, that um, is the equivalent of, as we go into future years, raising real estate a penny every year. And it's one of the reasons we held back this year. Um, this is not uh, a gap that is showing uh, big new things in the CIP. It's just carrying out the current plan. It doesn't include the reconfiguration of schools. That's a whole new conversation that's going to need to happen uh, with future councils uh, based on uh, what you learn from the $3 million you're planning to invest in the design and planning for the schools. Um, we don't talk about operational requests in here. They're really unknown, but we do know the operational budget does grow on occasion. Um, and, you know, this gap does grow over time the next three or four years to about $6 million. Meals. So uh, I would remind folks that the last time we changed uh, meals was in 16, just so you see that. I know that... Uh, it does suit people's purposes at that time to talk about how it's a 25% increase or a 20% increase right now. I just say it's it's a penny on the dollar. Um, and it is, you know, quite different than 25 or 20% uh, when we get into the actual math behind what happens when you pay your bill. Um, I would say also that um, th these are taxes that are collected after the price of your meal. And so they, it's just, a, you know, collected and handed over. It doesn't impact the price of anybody's, uh, you know, meal uh, in any form or fashion. We created this chart to show a couple of things. Uh, first of all, this 6% meals tax still has us situated quite fairly with our other cities, right? You know, we're still below the median uh, as far as that goes. And we do think that it is a fair uh, tax that people have the capacity to pay. And so uh, imagine that you uh, went out for a sandwich. Uh, you know, what we're saying is that staff believes that, uh, you know, your current bill on that $10, you know, sandwich and a Coke, uh, instead of being 1103 after taxes would be 10 cents more. Um, if you decided to buy the uh, trout uh, at Maya, uh, we believe you'd spend 20 cents more, 22, because I think it was $22, right? Uh, if you uh, were to take your family out for sandwiches, 50 cents more, uh, and it's a big night for your family, a dollar more. I think that, you know, the simple psychology behind when you go out to have a meal, you're deciding it's discretionary, you're going to pay that dollar, and the fact is um, you're deciding about the price of the meal more so than whether there will be 20 cents extra on tax. So I, I don't know that we've ever... Uh, in these discussions over a couple different fiscal years uh, heard any research that said people had decided where to go based on the tax add-on. So, uh, Meals tax rates return. Uh, part of the other reason this is in here is that when we look at expenditures out of people's uh, uh, income uh, and we compare that to back to real estate is that you see that the, in the the folks who make the least ex and also expend the least, you know, we think that this is only going to impact them by $1.25 a month, right? That's drastically different than if they're homeowners and we just reassess them. It's drastically different than whether they're renters and their landlord decides to bump up their rent. Um, and I just want to say that, you know, I never had a rent increase from somebody that was, you know, $11 when I was renting. It was $25 or $50, right? People tend to have these round numbers on rent, and I think that that's what's likely to happen in the market based on some of our real estate increases. 
And you see down the line, even for people uh, who are at the top incomes uh, in this uh, survey uh, by the Bureau and Labor Statistics, it only impacts their budget by six or seven dollars a month. Those folks own homes more than likely that are probably paying at least 50 or 60 dollars more per month based on our real estate uh, tax assessment. So it can be many fold difference uh, in the impact of choosing meals over real estate. So uh, we wanted to add here just a little uh, additional information about obviously this is discretionary. People do it. I'm not saying that nobody does it and you could rule this out completely, but it, you know, it is a choice that people make. Um, you know, we always require people to pay their taxes, right? And they do get passed on to renters. Um, we know that it's 8.7%. Uh, and I've already talked a little bit about the difference between meals and real estate. Mr. Murphy, is this the time to, yeah. that we can ask questions or you want to wait till the end? I'm happy to do it whatever way pleases council. Council? I, I'm just curious as to the issue that was brought up about the, the processing of the credit card, hmm. that the county somehow extracts that cost versus the city. Can we get some explanations to why that would make a difference on the impact on the restaurant? Because you know, it's the first time I've heard it tonight, but I imagine that, you know. No, I'm pretty uh, sure it was credit cards on the on both. Uh, on, on Visa the or MasterCard, uh, when you swipe the card, the vendor yeah. pays, let's say, a 2% fee on your $50 bill, and so that's an extra dollar that they pay that's invisible to you when you buy the meal. Uh, and I think that that's what they're referring to. What the county's policy is, I am not aware of. Okay. And so we can research that, that bring it to one of the budget Thank work you. sessions. But they also allow to write that, write those costs off as a part of, um, you know, the expenses for the business. That's what they're allowed to do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just curious as to what the difference is and, and how it benefits or doesn't benefit by having mm -hmm. one, which, which orientation the way the county does it, the way we do it. I should probably mention, you know, one last reason that isn't on the slide that we uh, built this budget around meals rather than real estate was that uh, we have data that shows that 35% of meals tax is paid by people who aren't our local residents. Uh, and so unlike the uh, uh, real estate tax, it was less burdened locally. Uh, lodging tax. Um, We've talked a little bit about this uh, over time. Uh, we know that we'd still be situated right in the middle of the pack here uh, with our peer localities. Um, it is a small difference uh, in the overall bill. Uh, I believe most consumer choices in our region are made on proximity to walkability uh, and being able to mm -hmm. walk to UVA or walk to the downtown mall. And that's why uh, Charlottesville revenues, despite the chart that's been given to us by Mr. Van Dorn, um, have continued to go up. And that's not to speak to occupancy, right? Because occupancy can still go down because we added almost 400 rooms last year, right? You know, and um, I didn't take a whole lot of the economics classes, but I do know about supply and demand, and I do know that it did have an impact on what they talk about at CACVB a lot, which is rev par, right? And so their average per room is down a little bit, uh, but. Uh, we have continued to grow revenue in this area. We have not had any dip. I know that the county has had an actual uh, revenue dip, dip. in uh, lodging. That is not the case for the city. How do we, well, first of all, thank you. I know you're not finished, <laughs> but thank you for stating that, those facts in the eloquent way in which you have. Hashtag. With the fact that he has no economics nope. background. Yeah, no dip. <laughs> So how do we get this message out consistent? I know tonight is the first night, you know, we're, we're going out. through everything. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Walker, we've seen your Facebook Live. We know you're, you're getting it out for those who didn't hear. But I mean, seriously, because many of the individuals who were here earlier, they didn't, they've gone, they're, they've left, they didn't hear this, and so be it. And I'm not sure if they will come on Thursday. But how do we, because this is what we're, saying and we're trying to fight against the, the other rhetoric. I, I, well, 
without disagreeing with our friends behind me, uh, I'm sure that the restaurants will be back, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that there will be plenty of time uh, to share that message again. Yes. And, you know, we want to work uh, productively with them. You know, small businesses here are important to Charlottesville's economy. And I would just point out that by their own presentation to council, there's exactly the same number of restaurants as there was. And you know why? Because there's nowhere else to put a restaurant in Charlottesville. And every time one goes away, something else pops in there, right? So uh, I do think that the, the restaurant industry is quite healthy in Charlottesville. And our revenues continue to grow. If we went backwards and looked at the slide about meals uh, revenue, you'd see that we revised it in the year we're in. And we revised it even during the last two months that we've been talking to you about the possibility of tax increases because we know that it wasn't going to be 2.2 or $2.3 million per penny. It was going to be 2.4 plus. So um, that's because people are out buying meals. Thank you. Okay, personal property tax, um, you know, this is going up a little bit, uh, the economy's been a little bit better, people are buying new cars. Um, sales and use tax, also slight increase, moving up a little bit, it adds some revenue to the projections that allowed us to balance the budget. So uh, this is basically a slide to talk about where does the money go? Uh, you'll see that uh, the largest expenditure is, of course, to the schools, then to you know public safety and justice. That includes both our internal services, but also some major expenditures out to uh, jail and detention, which uh, you know totals another what seven million dollars a year. Um, and then <coughs> healthy families and communities follows that, uh, along with infrastructure and transportation, many others uh, blended in. Uh, the strategic plan is something we try and continue to revisit, and so we do represent uh, uh, that uh, for you both on council agendas but also in the budget presentation. So I just want to quickly talk about how that ties in here. So uh, affordable housing, you know, uh, this budget talks about $3 million for public housing, uh, the supplemental rental assistance program each year the housing rehabilitation, uh, and a total of $5.9 million for Friendship Court. And later I'll talk about what's not in there. I do want to point out that, um, you know, there's a lot of emails floating around uh, that you've received that talk about give $9 million, $9 million. Well, they, they had a little bit different way of spending it than we did. Um, but. Uh, in fact, this budget is proposing from staff $10.3 million in investment. Um, we'll talk about why those choices were made a little bit as we go forward. So uh, something that the mayor's already referred to and that uh, Commissioner Divers has worked uh, really hard on uh, is to um, talk about that I think what almost 70% of houses in the city are under $375,000 and so this had would have some applicability to all those houses as far as tax relief goes but to create these new tiers in here possibly even a tier of full relief depending on your income uh, and it would cost uh, near, uh, about $285,000 to do that uh, on top of what your investments have been in the past. Uh, race and equity, certainly a very important issue uh, in the city and important to me. First thing I did was uh, convene an advisory work group on our organization. We talk a lot about other organizations and how they're doing, and I'm expecting that in the next couple months we'll be able to report out on some changes that we'll recommend to you all and perhaps to the new city manager. Um, you know, there's lots of ways uh, that we're invested in race and equity. Affordable housing is one of them, uh, but also the minority business program, workforce development, Office of Human Rights. The list is long, and it's one of the reasons uh, that i um, happy to be here uh, working for the city. Workforce development, economic development, uh, you know, this is really something that uh, we've been uh, working on ever since the Growing Opportunities Report. Uh, I think it pays great dividends, moves people into living wage jobs, 
creates a lot of partnership uh, with both uh, places of business and educational institutions, and it's a real strength of what we're doing here in the city. There are a couple things uh, that are new positions uh, in here, uh, not nearly as many as our staff uh, would have liked. I'll talk about that in a moment, but um, I will say that uh, one of them uh, is a position in risk management will ser serve the entire city um, and will provide uh, some training and policy work, uh, making sure that we have best practice in the way of safety uh, in all in city environments. A security manager, which uh, we decided to house in the police department, also a citywide position, um, and that is really to look at uh, you know security throughout the city, um, to talk about uh, building safety, uh, you know, to um, look at our policies and practices, uh, some of our event uh, planning. Uh, all of this is uh, really important, and we've been uh, convening a committee on safety and uh, emergency uh, for about a year and a half now, and it is enough work that we need to staff it with somebody at this point. One of the things the budget does is continue to invest in our employees. Um, there is over two and a half million dollars in employee investment. Uh, we do take the next step in living wage. We've been on this journey a little longer than some other folks, and so uh, we're uh, recommending that we take that next step, get to $15 an hour from $14.40. Um, that uh, is a movement of about 4.17%. I didn't create that number <coughs> out of the air in the COLA for the other employees. Um, and, you know, I just want to say that we're aware as we look at our folks uh, and compare them out in the marketplace, um, while I've talked a lot with you how they've fallen behind, for example, in police, that has become true in more and more departments. And this is really just the first step. Um, we need to continue to do more to talk with you all about where people are placed in the market. Uh, we need to talk about all public safety um, with regard to their uh, compensation. Um, and we need to do that uh, as far as total compensation goes, right? We give some rich retirement benefits, but uh, in recruiting today's workers, maybe they're not planning on being here till retirement, so we're not as competitive talking about how great it's going to be in mm -hmm. 20 years. So um, we need to uh, think about that uh, as we move forward. Um, one thing is that uh, because of some good cost experience, uh, we're not having to pass on any health care premiums this year. This is different than the presentation you heard from the school system or some other localities. So we are quite lucky in that regard. Of course, we do uh, a lot in the way of uh, wellness. Um, new online benefits and self-service. This is really just a new program. This was talked about in the efficiency study. We're trying to be more effective in the way we get people enrolled and have them interact with their benefits in a more effective way. City schools. So I talked with you all briefly during the school presentation about how we got to the 3.37 or 3.368 million. Um, really doing all we can as a staff uh, to uh, support the schools and their mission. We know it's an important priority to both the council and the community. Um, but in some ways, we had to make a lot of choices in this budget. Uh, and uh, so um, in a very uh, collaborative effort, Dr. Atkins and I talked about, uh, you know, the management of that half a million dollars uh, and uh, had agreed that that was something that they'd be able to manage, understand their advocacy uh, tonight. So uh, in the CIP, uh, basically, you know, we have another, what, six and a half million dollars uh, dedicated to the schools. Some of it, those big classroom changes that will happen uh, as they do each year, over a million dollars. Some of it, the uh, big uh, pre-construction planning that we need to do uh, so that um, if council in the future uh, says, we want to do this reconfiguration, and it's going to cost somewhere between 55 and $80 million to deal with these two facilities, then it will really be grounded uh, in new data. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. 
So uh, the strategic initiatives, this is just a little highlight uh, to talk about. Uh, you've done a lot of great things with the fund uh, that you have over the last uh, several years, and in particularly in the last year, you've dedicated over a million dollars that you had in that budget. Um, you know, in looking at all of the variables out there, we did not add any new funding to the Council uh, Strategic Initiative Fund. However, uh, we still have just under $600,000 at your discretion uh, in these funds right now. Uh, wanted to tell you uh, that Mr. Vandiver uh, is going to, I believe I might have said this uh, in a public meeting before, but for the purposes of the budget, want you to know that we'll be realizing this cost of DMV Select. Uh, it's going to be a great service in the City Hall lobby where you'll be able to do a limited number of the DMV services here rather than out on Pantops. We are the second busiest DMV at the state, and I can tell you from experience, you can sit there for a while. Um, support Services Manager. Uh, at NDS uh, is a position that was recommended in the efficiency study. Uh, the assistant director, Missy Creasy, does a tremendous job in NDS, but she also has 15 direct reports, which is kind of outside any norm uh, in uh, this line of business, uh, and this will gr help greatly by taking some of that burden away. Stormwater operations is going to move uh, out into the utilities uh, fund. It was in the general fund before, uh, be absorbed in the current rate structure, uh, and we'll get some good service and coordination out of that move. One of the things that's in here in the way of new positions, and I'd like to see more of these, uh, but uh, is to uh, transition for relief drivers into full time. Um, and uh, we're, we're looking for, you know, consistent drivers out on the road not having you know messages about this route's canceled today or we're going to have four routes instead of five um, and uh, the fact is that I think when we start having this discussion there was 40 to 41 full-time drivers uh, right and that's accounts for just over 1600 drive hours a week well uh, they have in fact I think over 2400 hours a week of drive time and so for me, I looked at that just on the the efficiency of I have to find in little bits and pieces with relief folks, and maybe not in little bits and pieces, maybe they work a lot already, right? Um, this, uh, you know, a third of our scheduling capacity, right? And I'll just say, while I was never a transit director, I did run 24-hour care facilities, and we tried to run ours at more like 85 to 90% was taken up by the full-time people because even when you do that, they get sick, they take vacation, they get training, all those things happen. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think we need to really change this over time. Four is what we thought we could afford for right now. We'd like to continue to see this grow in the future. I believe that we are trying to get, yes, yeah, we are trying to get this up to 14 more over time. And that's before any route additions, which, as you know, there mm -hmm. is some discussion about mm -hmm. that going forward. Uh, the more drive hours that we put out on the road, the more we're going to want to see this go up in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, outside nonprofit agencies, you know, some budget years we spend a lot of time talking about this in work sessions. This is a frozen year. I'm not uh, anticipating this is going to be in the budget a whole lot. We're going to be back in front of you at the end of April. Uh, beginning of May, Ms. Thomas is polling you about the date for the work session. So um, we'll be talking about this process for the future years. Uh, one thing that we are looking to fund here because you're funding it now is you launched with some monies that a previous council appropriated um, for diversion, this uh, therapeutic docket, which is in the Charlottesville General District Court. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you were on council yeah, when they appropriated the 99,000, but you but you did take part of that 99,000, 55,000 to launch the program in the year that we're in. So, um, agencies uh, evaluated by Office of Budget and Performance Management that aren't really ABRT because they're more either quasi-governmental or contractual agencies. There are some increases out there. You can see that some of them are uh, large. 
Uh, however, there are some decreases in there because, um, you know, we do have less share of the inmates at the regional jail. We do have less share of the inmates uh, at the juvenile detention center. Uh, and relative to our partners at the city and county, we are, uh, you know, having less of a share of the overall calls into 911. Not that we had less calls, they had a big uptick in calls, and so our share is less. So, um, as I said before, in a different section of this, you know, debt service is going up uh, about 850000 every year. Big new payment. Um, the general fund uh, will be contributing $1.46 uh, to the CIP. Uh, and, of course, part of this is from your year-end year appropriation uh, that we did in December. So, some big highlights from the CIP, you know. This accounts for, uh, I think we, uh, maybe 29 to 30 million of the 35. And a lot of the other stuff is like paving and maintenance kind of things. Um, but you can see that there's some big uh, items in here. I don't see, uh, you know, like the future general district court. And uh, this is just 2020. Those are out further. So uh, this is just in the year that we're in, which is a big change uh, from previous years. So this is what people really like to talk about at this time of year. What, what, what didn't make it in? Um, the Mike, school's full operating request. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. On the last, do you mind, it just hasn't come up in the, the bypass fire station. Can you talk a little bit about, I'm yeah. sorry, on the last slide, I, I yeah. should have asked you when you were there. So uh, this is something that had been studied, uh, and I believe the design was put in by previous councils. Um, and our facilities folks have worked on it for a while. Um, you know, it is the modernization of that, of those areas, uh, you know, changing the inside of the station, but I believe also some changes in the structure of the station to accommodate larger trucks. 10, what's that? Up to 10,000 square feet of space. Yeah, so 10,000 additional square feet of space. Does, does this, this is a, it's a capital, how does it fit into the? It's a bonded project uh, on the capital improvement program, and it would be projected um, to be completed, or, or the expenses are all loaded into 2020. It's not spread out over the five-year plan. Okay. So, excuse me, then, does that mean like the debt service? Is there any notion what the debt service, which is, the, which, which is what we then pay in the operating budget? Yeah. That, what is the debt service associated with that? Mr. Cullen is sitting here, but, you know. I, I mean, we, we are starting to look at that kind of We could certainly right provide now. it Thursday night. Okay. Uh, you know, I mean, imagining that a lot of times when you take the debt, it's like, what, two and a half, two and a quarter of what you're looking at there. So let's say it's $9 million over 20 years, 450000 a year ballpark. But that would be a guess, and we'll confirm on Thursday. Okay. What's not in here? So the school's full operating request uh, is not in here, based on my discussions with the superintendent, and basically uh, in understanding that we ourselves weren't putting everything in here that our departments uh, had requested either. Uh, it's not that we ever asked anybody to make any cuts that we weren't making also. Obviously, school reconfiguration. Council did uh, decide that for now, what's in the CIP is the $3 million. This is for a future council to decide what goes in here for the reconfiguration. There's been a whole lot of discussion tonight, and I bet there'll be some more about the affordable housing fund and the flexible dollars. Um, so for me, you know, there's some language that's out there about we zeroed out things. Um, and in the past, uh, you know, the year we're in, I think there's $3.9 million in investment in affordable housing in the year we're in. And we're taking it from 3.9 to 10.3. So um, I'm not sure that we zeroed anything out. We may have been a little more prescriptive uh, than some people cared for, uh, but that uh, is, is not exactly accurate to say anything went away. Is there a grant fund that anybody can apply to? Not any right now. Um, it was my opinion that if council wanted to add that in based on the planning commission recommendation mm -hmm. or the feedback from citizens, that there was going to be ample opportunity to discuss that through the work sessions. Um, in addition, um, I think you heard tonight reiterated several times that there's two big concerns, 
And they would be my concerns too. Where is home ownership in this? And where is homelessness? Both very important. Uh, on the home ownership front, uh, council's been generous uh, on the home ownership uh, allocations in the past three years, uh, nearly one and a half million dollars during that time. And we still have almost $1.1 million of it left to give out specifically to Habitat. So, you know, the, the CIP is a one year budget and a five year plan. And so did I think it was urgent and important to put in more funding for 2020 based on all of the needs that are out there? No, it's true that it's not put in. So, um, but I do think that there are still ample resources to fund another year of affordable housing uh, for home ownership. Now, the homelessness is a slightly different uh, issue. It hit us at a funny time uh, in the budget process. Uh, I was literally approached about it on the day that it was already public and we were presenting to the Planning Commission. Um, and while those discussions are advancing, and I will be the first one to advocate, I st stood here and told uh, the Planning Commission, I believe uh, in SROs, right? I think the single greatest thing we did for homelessness in this uh, community is the crossings. Mm -hmm. um, but in order for an SRO to happen here, um, there needs to be a clearly identified parcel. And in the discussions I've had with folks on this, the parcel has changed at least three times where it's going to be. Um, and uh, also Wait, on this front, what's that? What? What's the parcel? Well, as, of, as of last week, I was told it would be on Avon. I've heard it was going to be on 6th Street. I've heard it was going to be other places. So no, no, no. I, I, I'm... I'm happy to... Yeah, we'll have that discussion. Yeah. Um, that all said, the other thing that is absolutely critical that is a non-starter for bringing in an SRO is a commitment of the vouchers that will be needed for the residents. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I've taken up this topic uh, with uh, Mr. Duffield several times, and, you know, it really would take a vote by the Housing Authority uh, Board in order to allocate those vouchers. So um, when I hear about a project uh, that might build uh, beds and need 50 vouchers uh, for people, that's exciting to me as a homelessness advocate and somebody who served on the TJAC board for a long time. Um, but for FY20 funding only, which is my concern in presenting you with a budget, I don't think it's ready for the million dollar request or the two million dollar request that may be coming. And it's only that reason that it's not in the budget today. So um, if we were here a year from today, uh, I would hope that we'd be talking about where it is mm -hmm. and that there's vouchers. Um, but um, for this budget only, uh, those are the two big topic areas and I think that uh, one needs to wait and there are resources for the other. You know. Our departments throughout all the funds, general fund and otherwise, uh, ask for a lot of things in their budget, new requests. Um, and there's $5.3 million worth of those new requests that we did not put in. Um, in fact, on their operating budgets, uh, what they originally submitted, uh, because we said we have to be a part of this process too, we cut $1.39 million from those operating budgets. Um, and we talk about the CIP and, you know, what's in there. And uh, I just want to remind folks what's not in there, right? So while the CIP is the largest it's ever been, um, there's also almost $110 million worth of projects that staff thought were important um, or neighborhoods thought were important that we couldn't put in, right? There's only so many things you can pay for at any one given time. Now, if you want to add to that the 55 million, you know, and get us to $165 million worth of projects we can't build, I, I just want to put into perspective that while we're spending a lot in the CIP, there's still lots of other work that people have identified that would be worthy and important work to do. So, we will have lots of meetings. I don't know if we need to say what the dates are, uh, but uh, starting with this Thursday night. Um, and I think there are some tweaks I would want to reinforce with the public. Council certainly aware of this. There was some feedback, uh, and we wanted to make sure we maximized counselor availability. The work sessions did change from the very earliest times that we started talking about this. It's all accurate on the city website now. Uh, but, you know, the 7th and 14th have always been there. The 16th is a new date. It's a Saturday. 
It's 2 p.m. <coughs> yeah, 16th is 2 p.m. It is going to get changed right while we're standing here. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we've been hitting the median on all this other stuff. So, yeah. Um, so, work sessions are a little later than they have been in the past, six to eight instead of five to seven on the two Thursdays that are coming up here. The budget forum is happening on the Saturday for the first time, I think, in probably 10 years, right? Uh, to get some different folks uh, an opportunity mm -hmm. to give voice. The next time that we're here at council, we'll have a public hearing on the budget. Um, I imagine there will be many signed up. Uh, and then on the 19th, we'll have another work session uh, to hopefully get close to wrap up. Uh, we have held, there were originally two dates that next week, the 27th and 28th. Um, we're holding the 27th in case we have more work to do. Um, uh, the 28th is off your calendar right now. We also had the 4th of April originally. That is also off your calendar. So. Uh, we're hoping that April 1st we'll have the second public hearing on the budget uh, and that Monday uh, we will have one of those um, what are usually five-minute meetings to approve the budget. So that's the process going forward. You can find out more about all of this uh, on our website at charlottesville.org slash budget. Just one point of clarification for my colleagues in regards to the homelessness piece. There will be more information provided to you all this week specifically in regards to budgeting as well as some um, alternatives um, for funding streams and for those who are listening this is specifically in regards to the potential idea of a crossings to and which would provide 50 units for uh, those who are chronically homeless and 30 units for those below the 40 percent AMI 50 percent AMI excuse me so you all will get that information this week but thank you, Mr. Murphy. Outstanding job. You even got some snaps. <laughs> it's an unfamiliar place for staff, so right. we'll try to take it in stride. Yeah. Quit while you're Any, here. Um, additional questions? So I, I just want to ask my colleagues, too. And reading in the, um, the, the local paper, it it popped out at me that the city council and clerk budget had increased from 35000 163 to 609,683. So That's I'm how I read it the first time, too, and I lost some sleep. And then so I realized it was an increase of 35,000. Okay, good. It, I, when I read it, same I was going to say, I almost, oh my gosh, I almost what does that Mr. Mean? Murphy over the weekend? I was like, wait, how do we go? What? No, it was just so can, the, the can delta we, was 35. Okay, so that it was just the way it was written? No, I think it was written correctly, but I, I think when you're reading it quickly, which I did as well, okay. I had to go back and read it at a slower so pace. So the, the correct way to understand this then is the the city council's budget increased by $35,000 yes. to 609683 Yes. Okay. Not that, that it increased by five. That was, that was brought up to my attention, and I just want to make that very mm. clear. Well, I will just say if you two were confused, then the public probably was That's confused. Not, yeah, yeah, so hope maybe our journalists can do better. <laughs> That's good reporting. <laughs> On that note. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any. So I guess our, yeah, we have a lot to talk about Thursday, yeah. and I okay. think we can think about this and be ready for questions and discussion Thursday. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. All right, and so we'll take a ten-minute okay. break. It's only one art. It's only we're one we're so close. We're so close. No, I can we just do oh, the one art? Okay. Oh. <laughs> can we do five minutes? Ten five minute break. Ten. She's the mayor. <laughs>
this meeting to order, Dr. Bellamy? <laughs> 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 okay, you got it. All right, next we have the South First Street Redevelopment Critical Slopes Waiver First to One Reading. Good evening. Good evening. Carrie Rainey with Neighborhood Development Services. The Charlottesville Redevelopment and Housing Authority has requested a waiver from the Critical Slopes Ordinance, Section 34-1120B, in order to construct multifamily residential units, associated parking lots, a community resource center, and a library at 900 to 1000 South First Street. Critical slopes are defined as a slope which has a, run, has a slope of 25%, which includes a horizontal run of at least 20 feet and a square footage of 6,000 square feet and is also located within 200 feet of a waterway. There are currently, uh, excuse me, currently 27% of this site includes critical slopes. The Planning Commission discussed the critical slope waiver request at their February 12, 2019 meeting. At the meeting, the Planning Commission focused on the importance of the strategic investment plan, which emphasizes walkability to downtown and a desire to take advantage of parks and passive recreation. The importance of proper preservation of the existing trees noted to be preserved in order to ensure their continued health. The importance of constructing the buildings close to First Street first in order to establish erosion and stormwater measures uphill to further protect the critical slopes. In the construction of the critical construction on the critical slopes, wherein the easternmost building may have the greatest impacts on those slopes. The project supports goal one of city council strategic plan through objective 1.2 to increase affordable housing options. The planning commission took the following action. Mr. Heaton moved to recommend approval of this application for a critical slope waiver with conditions on the basis that the public benefits of allowing the disturbance outweighed the, outweighed the benefits of preserving the slope and that due to the unusual physical conditions of the site, compliance with the critical slope regulations would unreasonably prohibit use of the site. Ms. Dow seconded the motion. The commission voted six to zero to recommend approval of the application for a critical slope waiver with the following recommendations. One, require erosion and sediment control measures that exceed minimum requirements in order to mitigate potential impacts to undisturbed critical slope areas per section 341120B1 A through C, included but not limited to silt fence with wire reinforcing and six feet stake spacing, and B, other measures in, in excess of the minimum requirements determined by city, city engineering staff to be necessary to protect Pollock's branch from sedimentation. Two, the critical slope area outside of the approved encroachment areas, should such a waiver be approved, shall be clearly marked in the field and the approved stormwater management plan and construction plan shall include a note requiring such limits of disturbed area to re undisturbed area to remain for the duration of construction and land disturbing activities. Three, final stabilization of the area of critical slopes disturbed shall be permanent measures to include replanting of native tree and shrub species to restabilize the critical slopes and potential wildlife habitat. Four, memorialized construction methods presented by the applicant to phase construction of the buildings with the first two buildings adjacent to First Street to be constructed first in order to create a better stabilized site and create a more efficient erosion measure. And five, prior to disturbance at the site, install a fixed immovable barrier to protect root zones of existing trees identified to be preserved at the drip line to remain throughout full completion of the construction. Staff recommends that condition five is modified to the following as the number of preserved trees that were shown at the time of presentation to the planning commission may have been modified due to continue work on the final site plan. Um, and this is included in your resolution as well. Prior to disturbance at the site, install a fixed immovable barrier to protect root zones of existing trees identified on the approved final site plan to be preserved at the drip line to remain throughout full completion of the construction. I'm happy to answer any questions, and I believe the applicant's representative is also here as well. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any um, quest clarifying questions? And, um, Madam Mayor, I just have one. So, Ms. Rainey, thank you. Um, I just want to hear against, it's stats 
staff's position that these mitigating actions are going to protect Pollock's branch from any damaging disturbance? That is generally correct. Staff had provided the Planning Commission with a list of recommendations for conditions um, of which the Planning Commission kept some and removed some and added some. In Thank a nutshell. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Okay. All right. Is there a motion? Hmm. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't have the motion. In front of me. <laughs> I. Madam Mayor, I move to adopt the resolution approving a request for a waiver of critical slopes provision pursuant to city code section 34-1120B6 for 900 to 1000 First Street South, CRHA. Second. Oh, sorry. Wait a second. Any further discussion? No. Just that everything that's and those, the Planning Commission's recommendation, those subtle things that Ms. Rainey just mentioned are all within that resolution. I'm just well, trying to make sure I'm clear. I did want to make sure to clarify your earlier comments about the resolution <coughs> and the changes that were made. Mm -hmm. Certainly. So the resolution um, that was included in your packet includes the conditions from the Planning Commission exactly with the exception of Condition 5, um, which you'll oh, actually did not get changed. We recommend it gets changed to say within the approved final site plan. So we should. So I think mm, the motion should, should, be amended. should be amended to include the language that Ms. Rainey just stated. Mm -hmm. That's why I, I will okay. accept the friendly amendment to my motion. Second. So moved. Or so moved. Well, I don't know how to. Okay. Yeah. All right. And I just have one comment to, okay. um, that I think, um, uh, and I, I want to thank Mayor Walker for encouraging me to um, reach out to the Housing Authority and the residents, the Public Housing Association of Residents, to have a discussion about visioning for the entire site. And Mayor Walker joined me, and it was a very fruitful, productive meeting that I think we're all excited about um, and, and just very encouraged. and. Um, I think we're all just want you to know we're behind you 100 percent. Well, echo those comments. I think the Housing Authority Board, as well as the Redevelopment Committee, have put a ton of work into this as a Housing Authority Board rep. I'm very proud of where we're going and still a long way to go, but we are definitely making a great deal of strides. Also, thank you to Riverbend, um, as well as all of our other partners and Mr. Norris, as well as all of the staff from the Housing Authority. Thanks for your diligent work. And again, I'm looking forward to us continuing this work. Madam Mayor, just to add to the party, um, I wanted to talk about the, I uh, thank the, the um, community for receptivity to this pretty wonky idea about the MOUs, but I think the, mm -hmm. that it helps resolve the problem that really we were stuck on for a long time, which is if for an independent agency, how do you address the consequence of giving of kind of giving allocations when there's a lot of other independent agencies that we don't do that with and that and it um, by modeling it in this direction and thinking about other organizations where we have a partnership like RWSA and then we started doing a little bit of research and there are like books out there about public private MOUs this is a real established there's a lot out there to work from and I, I just appreciate kind of setting this sales so that we all know what we're doing and that we have a new model of partnership going forward so that does clarify and that's why you do MOUs between public and private so I, I really appreciate the openness to that. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion? No. Great job. All right. Um, oh. is this please the first speak? reading? No, it's only one. Oh. Right. 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 Yep. All right, and that carries five to zero. Great job. We put a lot of work into this, so great job. All right, next we have the imposition of fee for fire department inspections, first of two readings. Oh, look at us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this should only take an hour. <laughs> <laughs> you 
came with chokes. Yes, <laughs> just the one. Just the one. Don't, don't raise your expectations any higher than that. Um, good evening, uh, uh, Madam Mayor, members of Council, Mr. Manager. Uh, I'm Andrew Baxter, the Fire Chief of the City, and I have with me this evening uh, Battalion Chief Jay Davis, uh, who serves as the City's Fire Marshal and Fire Official. Uh, Jay's a 24-year veteran of uh, the Charlottesville Fire Department. Uh, we're here tonight uh, to talk about the adoption of the Charlottesville Fire Department Office of the Fire Marshal fee schedule. Um, earlier in the fall, during the budget process, uh, we were asked uh, during that process, were there any additional revenue streams that we could potentially bring to the table uh, to offset uh, expenses associated with what we do? And um, th th this was the obvious one to talk about and to bring forward. Uh, the Virginia Statewide Fire Prevention Code does provide for a fee schedule. Um, and the Virginia Code uh, provides uh, us as a locality with the authority to level, le levy those fees uh, for specific permitting and inspection activities uh, that take place under uh, Battalion Chief Davis's role as the city's fire marshal. And uh, the pace and complexity of the development in the city is only getting uh, greater and their activity of this office uh, is critical. Mm -hmm. um, and one way to, that's important to understand is that if we miss something during the development phase from a fire protection phase, it can be 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the road before that iterates out into a risk for uh, the community or for our firefighters. So it's, it's something we have to get right, we have to pay uh, particular attention to. Uh, so there's a series of, um, of fees that we have uh, proposed, uh, as I said, that are rooted in the statewide fire prevention code that we have adopted by ordinance. Uh, they mirror exactly what Albemarle County's fees are, and these are done uh, all across the state. Uh, somebody asked me earlier during this process, why have we never done this before? I can't give, an an give you an answer other than when I got here in September of 2015, I asked that question and there was no concrete answer. So, um, and I think uh, Jay is certainly the technical expert here uh, regarding, this, <coughs> regarding the specific provisions in the fee schedule. If you have any questions, we'd be happy to, to field those. Just makes sense. Yep. <laughs> Five minutes. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> UVA one. Give like an hour of questions. <laughs> so I know there was. Um, I received some questions about propane tanks yes, on the mall, um, and so would is that the two hundred? Would that be the two hundred dollar inspection per? What are the? If new if it's for above for a compressed gas, if it's above two hundred cubic cubic feet at the natural temperature and pressure. So you would have to add up either one large tank at that level, or it could be three or four smaller tanks. Once it gets to that volume, that would trigger uh, the $200 permit fee. That's correct. Okay. And there is a there is a specific particular risk that we're trying to manage there. Um, fortunately, that has not occurred in the city. Um, mm. There was an incident with a propane explosion at the Festi uh, Festival mm. two years mm. ago, I believe, down in Nelson County. Uh, so they don't happen very often, but when they happen, they, they, they're, they're pretty catastrophic. So so I know it's the um, order up. What's the name of that? Uh, I think that without being specific about, I mean, there's food cart vendors, mm -hmm. uh, and then there's cafe spaces with some of the portable heaters. Mm -hmm. and, and I think they all take kind of the same size as your grill at home. And so if you all could kind of help council understand how this 200 pound standard uh, would equate to how many of those heaters or how many propane tanks would be on site for a food uh, cart, that would help them to understand if it would sure. impact those small uses. <coughs> Jay? Yep, so, <laughs> I'm up. Uh, so when you're thinking about um, the process that a food cart, a trailer, um, or a van that has been converted into a food truck, mobile food unit, it's what are they using it for and how much do they need to work for a, an event, a day, a, a, an evening, or whatever. There may be, um, and your, your average grill you have at home has a, what's called a 20-pound bottle, right? And so you can connect those together and create an aggregate of propane in one location. You can also have some tall bottles that you've seen standing about this tall, and you'll see them on food like a trailer. 
and they're using a full, basically a full-size kitchen inside of that trailer, and they need that much propane there to be able to run and cook the, the kind of food they're going to make in that particular location. And so those are going to give you, those are going to be upwards of 100, 120 pounds, and that's going to give you a volume that's going to give you the, the liters that this is asking for. And the purpose of this is to make sure that they have the safety procedures and, and, and safety components built in because the concern is that they'll build these at home and then they'll travel somewhere with them and they won't have all the safety features with them. So the purpose of, and the inspection has nothing to do with the permit. We would still inspect it whether they do, whether we charge a fee for it or not. We're still going to go make sure it's safe. Mm -hmm. But in the amount of work that we're doing, in the amount that we're seeing it rising in the city, the fees will help us with the amount of work that we're uh, putting into this and get some uh, recovery back from that, that effort. Mm -hmm. So um, I hope that helps to, helps with the question. Mm -hmm. So there's some very simple carts that are only five feet across on the downtown mall. Would they have to pay this fee? Or there's some cafe spaces that have mm -hmm. half a dozen of the heaters with the 20 pound <coughs> tanks in them. Would they have to pay the fee? <laughs> It, I'm not trying to be evasive at all, but it, it's difficult to say until you get there and look at the size tanks and determine how many they have uh, in what space. And if they hit that, that if they trip that trigger, if you will, then they would be required. But it's going to take an inspector to go out and look at it mm -hmm. and make sure that uh, uh, the size tanks, because it could be, like I said, it could be, uh, Jay mentioned, they could be daisy chained together and any one of them, like your one on your home grill, would not uh, trip that. But you put five of them together and you're over that volume and, uh, and, if, and then you need a permit. They need to have extra ones there, like they're there for like a 12 hour period of time, like there's an event, um, like Fridays after five, and they know they're gonna be there for a long period of time. They may want to have several of those bottles there because they'll swap them out. Well, that's an aggregate amount of propane sitting in one space. That's what'll trip the permit for the, the, the fee. But again, we're still gonna inspect these to make sure that they're safe either way. So what happens when it's, uh for instance, um, a one-time event mm -hmm. or just for, so if it's just Fridays after five season, so <clears> they <throat> would pay the $200 for the... It's an annual permit. Yeah, that was my question. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and that's a good point that you're bringing up because that's something that we're having to deal with in the state, across mm -hmm. the state. So if mm -hmm. you have a food truck and you want to come to Charlottesville, you're going to have to get an inspection by us to work here in the city of Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. That's an annual mm -hmm. inspection. Mm -hmm. Fear not. Go to Admiral County, same thing. Do it all over again. Go to Richmond, same thing. Do it all over again. It's not really the best option for anyone that has one of these devices and they want to use it. But we aren't at a point in the, at the state level to say, mm -hmm. hey, there's, there's a state regulation now. You go to one place, get an annual fee, and no matter where you are in the state of Virginia, right. you can operate. Right. But right now this is what we're kind of working with and they can come from other states too they don't have to be from Admiral County they can be right here in Charlottesville but they can come from all over the place and some of them actually do and we have to make sure that we catch them or at least see them when we're here and make sure that they're safe and where they're setting up and what they're doing how they're operating they're operating safely and so the fee adds to that a little bit uh, uh, um, workload that we're trying to get accomplished and to try to recoup some of that effort Mm -hmm. Jay is uh, speaking at the state level. Jay is the um, on the Virginia Fire Chiefs Association. He's the head of the life safety section, and this has been an issue for us uh, with the Virginia Fire Chiefs for some time. Recognizing that each locality is doing this a little bit different, and it would be easier for us as well if there was some um, uh, commonality across the state. Mm -hmm. Now this is handled. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the county, what is their process? It, we're, we're, we would be mirroring, mirroring would if this have? ordinance passes exactly what okay. the county's doing. The only difference you would see is that in the city there's an ordinance that prohibits fireworks unless they are, there is a permit, and the county does allow fireworks. Mm -hmm. So there, if you'll see, on a, we did a, um, a, an estimate of what the revenue stream would be. We issued three fireworks permits last year, mm -hmm. 4th of July, um, Dogwood. Dogwood, Dogwood Festival, Festival, and I can't remember what the third one was. But you go to Food Line in the county, and you can buy fireworks. So would there be a possibility for um, a collaboration with the county? Yeah, that was my question. In what regard? Like you guys are saying you're doing the same process. Could, could you not be like a, an agreement between the two localities that if someone's paid this fee for this inspection, which you're saying is consistent between each jurisdiction, 
could they be something that covers both so that they're not having to have the redundancy of the city and I the I would county? defer to the city attorney on that one. That's a great sure. question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, really a fascinating discussion about the whole mm -hmm. idea of multiple jurisdictions and having to get a permit. I think to do that, um, to answer your question, I think it could be possible if the county would agree, but in order to do that, just like you all as a city council are approving your fire inspection schedule, if, if you approve it, the county has already approved yeah. there, so they would need to go back and amend their ordinance. But that isn't to say that they couldn't amend their ordinance and you couldn't have your ordinance to say that if you have one of these inspection permits for a particular mm -hmm. use, in one jurisdiction, mm -hmm. right. the fee would the inspection right. fee would be waived in the other jurisdiction. And I'm assuming that the, you all would want to figure out how to maybe share the permit fees. That yes. would be part right. of the discussion. Yep. Right. Yes. And, yeah. and and it's a great question. That it would be in line with um, I say to people all the time: if you want to look at great examples of of regional cooperation, um, mm -hmm. boots on the ground where it matters, look to fire rescue. Um, because of the way we interact and operate every day in our regional hazardous materials program and our regional technical rescue response. Um, we do not quite yet have an MOU with yeah. Fire Marshal Office, Fire Marshal's Office, but that's something that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. This would fit into that philosophy very well. Mm -hmm. Is that a discussion, Dad? Yeah, I think that'd be a great discussion to have uh, with the county executive. Yeah. Um, fits with the kind of collaboration that we've talked mm -hmm. about uh, in joint meetings between council and the board of yep. supervisors. I do think that there need to be some understanding ahead of time expressed about, uh, you know, we're going to share the revenue in this way, right? Uh, yeah. Because. Uh, I don't know what their volume is, and I don't know how to express ours, right? So it's, yeah. it, it's a little bit hard at the beginning, but I assume we'd have to measure that over time um, and have some sort of formula. But I think when you think about uh, some of these applications we've been focusing on, like a, a food cart or, you know, a food truck or something, you know, they are quite often parked at, you know, free bridge in the city and then at a county event the next day and does yeah. it seem reasonable that uh, they would have to pay both localities maybe not so i think it would be good for those yeah. small businesses too yeah. so so in the immediate for specifically a group like the food truck what do they do now because there there is some concern from them the ones that are on the mall so about the propane and sure so right now the only um uh, requirement they have to meet is a inspection by the health department okay because they're serving food right um and uh we do i guess what we would call a courtesy inspection at this mm -hmm. point uh, to make sure they're safe everything is good yeah. exactly um, yeah. and, and that's it they're good, good. I, I would add to that what i would say and and, and i certainly would wherever we land with this, there would be an educational piece to this. There would mm -hmm. be, I'll just say this, we'll throw out a year, there would be a time frame where we were doing inspection and we would say, okay, this is the inspection this year at this point in time, but just so you know, here's the fee schedule and this time, next time we come back or this time mm -hmm. next year, here's what you can expect to see. Mm -hmm. That would give them a chance to go, okay, well, I need to, I need a budget for that. I yeah. need to be prepared to do that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, this wouldn't be a, a right off the table mandate them. that you're going to, you know, we're going to start hitting people yeah. up with this. Because there, there is some concern from, from that group, particularly about uh, they may be shut down or there may be issues and whatnot. And I mean, I, Pressures coming from other places. There's always yeah. conspiracy theories out yeah. there. So I, I would I would point them to all the things we do in the community and in particularly in the community risk reduction fire marshal section. And we don't have a history of doing that. We okay. focus on education right. and we focus on mitigating high risks. Um, there is there is a there's an educational sort of carrot component to this, but there is to be fully transparent. There's a stick component to this too, and particularly when it comes to tents. Um, yeah. our, mm -hmm. our offices, Jay's office is not notified oftentimes until a day or two before. Um, day of. Or the day of, yeah. And, and we know from other jurisdictions that having a permit fee that's graded by how many days ahead of time you let us know, yeah. um, mm -hmm. that that does have a positive impact on change in behavior and, and mm -hmm. making sure that we're alerted ahead of time. Okay. So we'll let them know that they're good. All right. And thank you, ma'am. Yeah. One more question. So in the case of 
so you said it's once a year you get this permit for, but what about if your situation, like what would trigger like a situation changing within, you know, let's just say, let's use Mike's restaurant example, where, you know, they had four of these, you know, standalone heating units and now they have eight. I'm just trying to figure out like what is, what is the risk of there being multiple fees in one year for any one vendor and just trying to understand how do we even know about that and is yeah. it through an inspection and you know like okay now mm -hmm. we're coming back again and yeah. your situations have changed and now we're going to have to charge you this fee it'd be yeah. an annual it'd be an annual fee one time what we're looking at is where they're storing that propane and how they're maintaining it so one of the things we don't want them doing is filling a propane bottle in a building mm -hmm. so if uh, if a restaurant let's say on the mall the downtown mall has a heater that they want to sit outside they have two of them whatever and they do very well and they have three or four of these propane bottles and they want to keep them on site we do the inspection, hey, here's the area where you keep these, this is a safe area, it's acceptable, here's your fee, you know, thank you very much, we'll be back in a year. Okay, so we come back in a year and they've upped the amount. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, it's still the same inspection, we're still looking for the same safety concerns, and it's still the same fee. Okay, but nothing in, in within that year, if, if they change their circumstances. Mm -hmm. We've already looked at the you. space where they're keeping right. them, and as long as their process doesn't change, the process is the issue, as okay. long as the process doesn't change, where they store them, how they roll them out, how they fill them. As long as that stays the same, that's what we're talking okay. about. Yeah. Then if we've if we've crafted the relationship correctly in terms of framing it as education and wanting them to be safe, people will call us and say, "Hey, I just made this change. Do I need to do something different?" Um, mo most business owners want to do the right thing. So. But there's only one trigger point to, yep. that you know that would cause somebody to need the permit. So. In Miss Hill's example, I think what she's driving at, if somebody goes from having, you know, six of the heaters and then they decide they uh, would like to have the cafe space be really warm and there's <laughs> nine heaters, um, that that doesn't create a new $200 fee. No, no but that creates a concern for nine heaters in a small space on the downtown mall. So yeah. that's another conversation about yeah. <laughs> he was just he was illustrating my example more yeah. effective. No, we, that was what we, I was getting in, at. In theory, we wouldn't see that until the next year. And as Chase said, that would be the same annual fee the next year, and we'd make sure that it was safe. Yes. If I may make a comment, though, this has been a good conversation, but it, it does seem like it might be something that mitigates the pain of the permit fee if they know that it's got it's applicable to Elmont County as well, that they've got a region, a whole region that's um, open to them because they've got that, that permit that they bought once and then it's good for both. So I, I really do like that idea, yeah. if possible. Kind of plan in advance for tents. What's that? I'm just looking, planning it. I was looking at the tiered mm -hmm. schedule. Great. Thank you. Right. So Thank I guess you. we'll just Thank you. put this on our consent agenda. Well, we right. um, if, is that enough time to have the discussion with the? Oh, are we? I thought we were moving forward with this. With and the, then, just this, changing there, and then that's a more longer. That's term another discussion. long range thing. Right. Do, <clears throat> I think the real question here is with with a regional agreement that that would certainly take some time to yes, sir. to uh, mm -hmm. kind of iron out the details. I, I guess it's the council's discretion do you want to go ahead and implement the fee schedule and then work with the county to try to come up with some inter-jurisdictional agreement and then you would come back and amend your fee schedule that would be my preference been passed yeah, or do you want to wait before Im implementing your fee schedule well it sounds like he's not going to go you know, right down right now anyway. Right. It's, it's important to start educating the public yeah. and this is something that's okay. coming forward. It's going to take some time to really fully implement. And in the meantime, we're going to be looking at this regional partnership. So, so. And I just point out, I mean, the other alternative is, you know, we've got a lot of different kinds of fees in here, right? And so the majority of them are city specific right. and their site plans and, mm -hmm. and inspections of facilities. And, and what I heard was a discussion limited to things about food service and propane tanks. Right. So, you know, it's really only those two items mm -hmm. that we'd be going to the county about mm -hmm. on the collaboration. The yes. other things would stay distinct to the localities. Because yes. mm -hmm. they're occupancy based and they don't right. move. Yeah. So is there a date that you, um, expect to start charging the fees no well certainly by the end of the fiscal year so by july 1 correct because this was originally as i said one earlier i think 
um, this was part of a discussion about um, related to a new request that we have mm -hmm. that's still outstanding. That's another discussion, but okay. that's what generated the discussion about can you bring any revenue to the table? Mm -hmm. um, and you all, between now and then, will be doing the educational piece and talking to people and making sure. So if this does get approved, uh, we've really got two pathways to follow. One is sort of the mechanics of the administration of charging a fee in, in a, an area of our work that we've never done that before, mm -hmm. sort of a much smaller version of what we went through last year with the EMS cost recovery, making sure that mm -hmm. the, the revenue flows into the right fund and we, we're invoicing correctly and accounting for the funding correctly. And, um, and then the, the, in parallel with that is a, an outreach and communication strategy. And we've, we've got that lined up, but we're just waiting to, um, to get the final go ahead. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Um, is there a motion? We don't need to do that. Oh, this would go on the next okay. meeting's agenda since it's an ordinance. Okay. All right. No further discussion. All right. Other business? Yes, Mayor Walker. I just wanted to bring up, and I don't want to take up too much time because we're doing really well, um, just that idea of the synthetic tax and current finance district and uh, I do understand at this point that there has been, at least I th I'm believing that the, uh, the work of Anita Morrison and the Form Based Code Institute is going to begin again in the heart of the SIA strategic investment area to begin uh, engaging with the Housing Authority and the PHA Board about more details about the Form Based Code. And one of those details was to also look at the synthetic tax increment finance district because it's connected to this idea of the height bonus that, uh, that in order to get extra stories in a building project under this form-based code regime, you'd have to build affordable housing units on site and it would be automatic. It would not be based on a special use permit. Mm -hmm. And the special use permit scenario right now is the way that the the CAF, the Affordable Housing Fund, has been getting some money. It's, it, according to Stacey Pethia, it never was enough to sustain it, but it was some money. And that has been a, a point of some concern for the affordable housing um, providers and advocacy groups as to, okay, so what sustainable funding stream will we have for the CAF if we don't use a special use permit? <clears throat> and so that's why this was tucked in to Anita Morrison's work was to look at the feasibility of doing a, tax, a synthetic tax increment finance district at the same time as you would do that change in your zoning. So what I'm asking is that can we get a presentation on, the, on a future council meeting about that very topic so it can inform us about what to do and should we do a synthetic TIF and it would also be a way to make sure that we understand the implications of the um, going towards a height bonus regime. It's been told to me it's like a backdoor way of getting inclusionary zoning. It's still incentive based, but you don't do all that, all that song and dance over special use permit. So that I'm thinking, I don't know what the schedule is for that. I don't, I, I don't know what exactly is the time frame, but I, I would like to get the council's read about having that as a presentation. I would think it would be something we would not want to know anyway. But in light of our concern about having a sustainable funding stream for the CAF, it seems timely to talk about it now. So maybe, Mr. Murphy, you can get back to us when, when Brenda Kelly has a better idea as to when that's going to happen, when that will be ready. Uh, certainly very happy to do that. I'll talk with uh, Ms. Kelly tomorrow and also Mr. Engel, uh, you know, so that we can do that because some of that yes. property valuation, I guess, um, I think that what's going to happen is in order to really effectively present to council, we would need to determine some geography ahead of time. I had proposed Water Street. That you imagine. Okay. Uh, so. and, and I had presented that to Mr. Engel in the past. Okay. So um, just in playing this out in my mind in the moment, I would say if, if we want to think about citywide, 
the increment, right, for this year was six million dollars, roughly. And so I'm I'm guessing that when we compare um, small fragments mm -hmm. of that geography, that the dollars that council allocates in cash today to affordable housing, which has typically been, you know, anywhere from three to over seven million dollars is going to exceed any increment significantly. Um, and I'm not saying that's a reason to discourage the discussion, but um, uh, or, yeah, I, I, I guess I understand. Second, I, I you're I just talking about like the length of Water Street is what you want us to define, or you want to go? The idea that else? at the time was to look at one quarter, a growth quarter, as, okay. as a pilot, as, a, as an example, and to see what that could do. And I just want to say, I'm not saying, but the, 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 the funding that we've been doing is discretionary. Yeah. And this is a way to build in, institutionalize a funding stream based on a formula that would always go into the CAF, just like we have a funding formula that always goes into the public education. And we always exceed it, but they but the public schools always know they get that forty percent of new revenue. And so this would be a way to see what, what that does. If it if it's based on a quarter, maybe it's not adequate. Maybe we do a citywide kind of increment dedication, but it's an earmark to the affordable housing fund. So it's a way to get a very a, a, an institutionalized funding stream into that fund based on a budget policy. And then we can always go above that, but right now we don't have a floor. Okay, uh, we'll certainly, and what I will do is try and describe some terms and see if we're close Ms. to Ms. Morrison, Anita Morrison knows has a framework of what she's thinking about. I'm pretty sure about that, at least based on some conversations I've had with, with Ms. Kelly and and uh, Mr. Ikefina. So I think, um, mm -hmm. but is that, but I, I would think that that has to be something that the council wants to do. We already approved funding to do that work. I mean, I say, certainly think it's worth, it, definitely worth the conversation as we continue to Come look at what we're having. There's not a sustainable source of revenue, and we want to have one that we can kind of rely upon, having that flexibility year after year. And, and something I know has been been raised when we've talked about the importance of economic development, but then having the economic development turn into funding some of our highest priorities. So, I'm certainly in support. The time timeline is more what I'm concerned about, given where we're at right now. But you're saying that it, this can wait until after our budget. Yeah, cycle this is not. No, the, everyone's in a crunch because of the the budget work sessions, but um, but I think, and you raise a good point, um, Vice Mayor Hale, that it it is a way to, to actually demonstrate a community benefit with regards to growth, because the corridors, I mean, thinking Water Street and Water Street Extended, just think about it, when those detached brownstones come online, they go from basically zero or maybe minuscule revenue to tax revenue based on one and a half million dollar residences and we're not capturing anything from that and targeting it to the affordable housing fund it goes into the general fund but it's there's something about dedicating that stream to a community benefit that i think will help the community understand and help us know that it's a baseline Okay. With the exception of the community benefit of 40% of that money going to the schools, right? Absolutely, yeah. Great. Okay. okay. The only other thing I sent that, well, I don't know if everyone got the same letter I did asking for us to sign on for that opposing the dirty water rule. That, that oh, was, yeah. So did everyone get that individually, or did I just somehow get that? No, I think I got it too. I'm not sure I'm ready to talk about it tonight. But That's fine. I yeah, just, but this is something that we need to. So I was trying to get a sense for like, your feedback was that we is something we would do as a council and not yeah, individuals. Yeah, it was something that the council wanted to talk about it generally. Okay. Um, but it was it. It's another resolution type initiative based on um, water quality. Okay. We can table it. That's fine. I'm I'm willing to talk about it more fully at another date. Okay. Perfect. So I guess you got two counselors who want to do it. 
I'm just, I just was trying to figure out how we respond to these things just generally. I'm, I mean, they're looking for people to sign on to this letter and they were reaching out to us and, individually. And we've done that before. We've done, we've signed letters in support of, and I think it was worth looking into. Okay. But do you have to go, we have to go through an informal agenda to just to sign on to that? No, I think, so. I think okay. it's just saying to the, you know, Mayor Walker, could you sign a letter that, <laughs> that endorsed their position? Okay. So we just needed the support for that. Okay. That's usually, that's how yeah. it's A lot it's of the time we done. just do it in, in, you know, among us, and then if there's, if there's support, then it goes on a, we just announce it, you mm -hmm. know, or it goes on the consent agenda if it needs. Okay. But, but it doesn't need to be voted on. So we can no, 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 I knew that. We've done some things even right, just, just even more simply than this. Right. I just announce at the next meeting. Right. Sure. That's the tricky yeah. thing about five of us trying to do something together. <laughs> <laughs> the only other thing. <laughs> um, You're serious? Yes. I'm not losing my train of thought. CRB, yes. Um, there's an interest in them as they go through just the drafting of the bylaws, having a chance to kind of check in with us. And we just wanted to get a sense for is that all of council? Do we feel like that should be all of council gets involved in these meetings? Um, and there's been some dates thrown around and approaches we should take tagging on to the meetings they already have. Um, there were some other dates that we, we discussed, and so I just I sent you guys a summary with some options, and I just wanted to have a, have a sense so that we are. Yeah, they, pre they presented. I, I would made it, they already recognized that March was almost impo was pretty impossible, and I echoed that and said no, we'd have to wait past that. And so then there was some April dates, and then they even had some some May dates. Does this, does this really need to be a separate work session? Can't this just happen during a council meeting? Yeah. Like when we ask can, questions, like can they pr talk about promote? It? Yeah. They present it, and we. We get we We've get done there. a lot of work sessions. It seems like I'm not. Yeah, and I, I, mean, I think I mean, this for this, we'll mayor, probably but. need a session. I mean, I don't think this is. You think they're going to need a lot more give and take? I'm in favor of a session. Okay, I don't mind, but it's got to be past the budget season. Yeah. It's April. Okay. I think it's just an opportunity for them to put something in front of us and get feedback, so that then when they come and present. The bylaws that it's already had a thought we've already gotten some sunlight yeah. we're not like figuring it out on the day so would this be a situation where we we would a ask other kind of professionals to come and speak with us as well or yeah, i think we would need to have city staff there to see what okay. and um you know, and they were a legal standpoint and they were honestly yes. proposing it is even just a short a brief can it start in their meetings, their existing meetings earlier. They weren't anticipating being a full-on night thing. It was just an opportunity for them to have counsel and get some kind of... And I, I really appreciate Some that. agreement from us as a body and maybe 45 minutes and we're, we're out and they go on with the regular meeting. So I wasn't anticipating... They weren't... None, neither side of us was envisioning this to be some long sessions, work sessions, but more some a couple check-in points over the course mm -hmm. of maybe six weeks just to make sure that they're progressing to a point where they're going to be coming to us in early May with that deliverable. But I think this is a case where we, like, I can't represent Mike and Kathy at this meeting. No, I agree. What they would want to sure. accept. And that's why I was thinking yeah. we, we have to all be on yeah. board. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the idea would be that we would go to their meeting and it would be a, an, a you know, a noticed meeting where all the council would be with them with them that night, or, or is it just for the first part of the meeting? And then they move on to the rest of their agenda okay. as one way. And also, they've said that we could they could also just meet convene an, an additional evenings with that aren't tied to their meetings. We're just trying to make this as, as where were we? I mean, it, where were we? weren't we talking about bringing back the regular first Thursday work session? That, I mean, just I'm not sure this is going to take two hours to do. I, I see that I see that why we'd want to do a separate work session, but it does it is. You know, we used to put in these work sessions back on Tuesday during during the regular meeting. But if we're if we were to bring back regular monthly work sessions, maybe there's another thing that we need to work on also that could be put in this mm. agenda because oh, so other, it seems more than like one a thing lot. To it take seems, advantage of that. It seems a lot to create a two-hour work session just That's just true. for this one issue. Although I see the it's, it's it seems like a lot because usually work sessions are two hours and staff there and everything and after the budget season. So I'm wondering if there's another thing that's in the background that we could put in that we could schedule into this that's even related yeah G given but that, even given if it. we schedule the time and we get out an hour early right is 
we'll just at least have the time together. He's just saying that if we have other saying, topics that we're planning to do, like let's not bring ourselves convene like on all these separate occasions, but try to consolidate and, some and of these topics. And it used topics. to be that every first Thursday of the month we had a work session mm -hmm. slot. And then and it, because of transparency concerns, we got rid of that because we decided to put the work sessions in the regular Tuesday meeting so it wasn't at City Space so that everybody could see us deliberate and have these questions. It was right. on TV. But now we can put them on TV because yeah. we have yeah. social media. So I'm just, I'm just, anyway, if there's one other thing in the, a couple of, you know, one other thing that we're looking at having a work session on, I'm suggesting maybe that we would combine it with one about the bylaws. That, that's the only suggestion. And we have a month to figure it out. I don't want to put uh, Mr. Blair on the spot. I've been to none of these meetings, but I know that he has, and I know that the mayor and vice mayor have. It, it seems to me that this is meaty enough and an important uh. enough topic to you all that you would have a two-hour meeting. I don't yeah. think this is walk out in 45 <laughs> minutes kind of thing. Uh, you know, just respectfully, I think that okay. you would use the time. Okay. okay. I, I would agree with that. Okay. Yeah. So no the, then we have to manage expectations that it's maybe going to be one more meaty meeting and not check-ins because that was what was being proposed by the nice. CRB. It was like, right. we want to give you several dates of which we hope you can come to two or three of them, but they're going to be shorter so that we're not going down a, the wrong path for too long. Well, recommend that they send us anything that they want to look at. We can give them feedback um, through email and then we're already pushed out into April when they recommended that so we try to nail down one March. date in April. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's it. I'm not Matters about a poet. <laughs> Good evening, Good Mayor evening. Walker, City Council. I'll be very brief. Just with all the discussion on divestment and fossil fuels, I wanted to bring to your attention an article from just last Friday in the radical leftist publication, The Economist. <laughs> American sustainable funds outperform the market. Sustainable investing, once a niche area of interest, has moved into the mainstream. Earlier this month, a survey showed that 75% of American asset managers say their firms offer sustainable investing strategies which focus on environmental, social, and governance issues. Almost 90% of fund managers think it is no longer just a fad. Investing in line with your values is no longer just fashionable, it actually delivers value too. Last year was the worst for American investors since the financial crisis. Data released last week by Morningstar, a data provider, showed that sustainable American funds outperformed the, the broader market and recorded their third consecutive year of record inflows. So that's from last Friday from The Economist. Just something to keep in mind during the divestment discussions. This could be good for the environment and good for the city uh, and whatever we're investing in. So thank you. Thank you. So I, I want to respond. I really appreciate that contribution because that, that reframes this entirely as something mm -hmm. that we would seek. I mean, not not there's anything wrong with it being discussed, but you're absolutely right, and it's it's a it's a positive. It's an argument for the sorts of firms that you're investing in rather than the ones you're not investing in. And it's just I, I would like to know about that. Can you I'd like the evidence link? on this too. I was going to say I'd be happy to email this to you guys. There's charts and whatnot. That's and great. I'm sure there's plenty of other info out there. So uh, I'll send that along to you. Thank you. Thank you. Would you mind also stating your name? Oh. <laughs> Sorry, Brad Slocum, city resident. All right. Is there anyone else? I also promise to be brief. Sina McGill, um, city resident. Um, just to kind of echo that, I did a quick figuring on, I've dabbled a little bit in some socially responsible investing stocks, and I figured out my rate of return in the last year was 7.5% which is pretty significant, in, and that's all in solar and alternative energy stocks. Mm -hmm. um, I also wanted just to bring up very quickly that one of the things I noticed in the school budget that was being cut was the security, the 75000 in security, which was for Walker School and Buford School. I would like council to just to double look at that, just because, one, both of those are open campuses, while the rest of our elementary schools now have mm -hmm. key cards and... Um, these schools do not, um, and with the rate of violence that we have seen nationwide. Um, and I also noticed that on the sideline of it was it said $250,000 grant. So does that mean that we're going to lose $250,000 that we could be getting from another grant 
if we do not have the $75,000 matching. Oh, is it, is it um, and I would really hate to see us throw away that amount of money for something that we need. Um, if we can and we didn't something. tell them what to cut. No, I, I realize that. Oh, okay. I know that. I just, I just, I'm bringing this up just when I saw that. I just wanted to put that forward. Um, and I promised I was going to be brief. So thank you very much for tonight. Have a good night. All right, thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? All right, meeting adjourned. Yeah. <laughs>